Hi, my name is Dr. Jennifer Gardella. On April 4th of 2018, I gave a TED Talk at my alma mater, Fordham University, titled, Creating Peace in Your Divorce. Unfortunately, there was a problem with the audio, so I have redone it for you here today. Please help me in spreading the message of the importance of creating a peaceful divorce. Hi, my name is Jen. I bring my 16-year-old daughter Stephanie with me tonight. On July 2nd of 2017, we lost her father, my ex-husband and dear friend after his 82-day battle with anaplastic thyroid cancer. John was only 50. Ugh, those words, they stick in my throat when I introduce myself at Safe Harbor. It's a bereavement support group I attend with my youngest daughter. She sits with the teen group and learns to deal with her emotions of sadness and anger as she processes the loss of her dad. I attend the parent component to help me with the grief over the passing of the father of my three children as I wonder, how am I going to do this without him? Now, most of you may be thinking, is Jen actually upset that her ex-husband has died? Wouldn't most people be secretly relieved or dare I say not sad if their ex was to pass? But John and I had broken down the barrier of what a typical divorce looks like, and instead, we became a co-parenting team for ourselves and our children. You see, we did not battle, but we know plenty of people who do. As we know, 50% of marriages end in divorce, so about 50% of children are being raised in divorced homes. If you are not directly impacted as a parent or a child, you probably have a close family member or friend who is. So most of us have felt that tension and heard the horror stories. The problem begins when divorced parents pick up the sword and start to fight because of what was done to them. An affair is uncovered or one leaves the other. One tries to move the children to another state. One says, I'm never paying you alimony and the legal battle commences. There are hurt feelings, drained bank accounts and crushed dreams. And usually a declaration of, we will not be friends. I'm here to tell you today that there is a much better way. But let me back up for a minute. John and I met in 1988 as undergraduates on the Rose Hill campus of Fordham University. I was a sophomore and he was a senior. We were married in 1993 and had three amazing and crazy daughters, Allison, Victoria, and Stephanie. Now, unfortunately, our marriage did not work out. But early on in the divorce process, we established peace. How did we do it? Well, like most divorcing couples, there was that moment. That moment when you can start a war or choose a path of peace. For us, that moment occurred at our middle daughter's band concert. I arrived early and texted John to let him know that I had saved him a seat. And he texted me back, I don't have to sit with you anymore. I replied, okay, but when our daughter looks down from that stage, she should see her family sitting together. Plus, I have the other two with me, and they are going to think it's weird. Let's not make this weird. He came to sit with us. Neither one of us ever allowed this to happen again. We never picked up that sword, and instead, we decided to be a team. What happens when parents pick up that sword? Well, the parents actually start to act like children, and so the parenting is poorly managed. With little parent parenting coordination and communication, the kids are forced to manage their own schedules, activities, and payments. Tell your dad you're gonna be late getting to his house. Hey, tell your mom she owes me for violin camp. And the kids think, why can't you just tell him yourself? The kids are too young to coordinate all this. They wind up confused about who is doing what, going where, and when. And the problem is this. Most kids who live in divorce are already confused enough. They live in two very different houses with two sets of rules, and they have to schlep their stuff back and forth based on some schedule they never asked about and they certainly never agreed to. Kids need their parents working together to get them through this. Now, John and I didn't do everything right, but we did support each other. When there was a punishment, it was carried through at both houses. We were flexible with holidays, and he was invited to my home to sit and watch the kids open their presents on Christmas morning. In fact, I even made sure he had a pair of matching pajamas so he fit in. Don't get me wrong, we weren't sitting around singing Kumbaya, but we had each other's backs. And then, unbeknownst to us, an 82-day clock started ticking on his life. 
I can remember day one of the battle, diagnosis day. John was visiting with a surgeon to talk about having a small bump removed on the back of his neck. I checked in with him after lunch with a text to see how he was doing. He texted back, I have anaplastic thyroid cancer. At first I thought, John, what the heck? Like we really need this now? We're both just settled in our new lives in Pennsylvania. I just got remarried and Dave and I travel all the time. This is my time to build my business and start my new life. I know, it was a little selfish. It then hit me. I mean, oh, my poor friend, it's cancer. He must be a little scared, but it's just thyroid cancer, a little outpatient procedure, a little radiation, he'll be fine. Wow, this may even ruin summer, and John loves summer. And then I wondered, what is this anaplastic part of this diagnosis? And I sat stunned as tears instantly filled my eyes as I read, rare, aggressive, and deadly. And I wondered, what are we in for? Well, we quickly found out. By day nine of the 82, we were in it. He had come out of his first surgery already with a tracheotomy and a feeding tube, and he could not speak. I brought the kids to see their father in Philly into the ICU. I didn't want them to have to navigate the hospital by themselves. I also wanted John to see that I was supporting him and that I was staying close to the girls. I was so glad that I was there. Our girls walked out of that ICU room crying and scared. On day 72 of the 82, our daughters learned the meaning of hospice and that their father would soon be entering. They visited John and he shared with him that despite daily radiation and that weekly chemo, the tumor continued to wrap itself around his neck. My husband and I were there to catch the girls as they walked out of John's room. I don't think I've ever hugged them as tight as I did in that moment. I realized there was nothing I could do to take away their fear. Dave then took a moment and he went in to talk to John. He promised that whatever happened, he would do whatever he had to to support me and our daughters. John looked at my new husband and said, I have so much respect for you. Thank you. That was my ex-husband, and that was our friendship. On day 81, John already laid in hospice unconscious, and I told my girls to say everything they wanted to say to him and to start to say goodbye. At hospice, I spent some time with John's girlfriend as we both sat in shock that this had progressed so quickly. I asked her if John had mentioned anything he wanted me to do on his behalf for the girls as they grew older. She said when she had brought it up, all he would say was, Jen's got this. He knew I was going to take every parenting step forward for both of us. And finally, there was day 82. When John passed the parenting baton to me for the last time, it was a bright and sunny Sunday morning. I took the call from his sister and bawled in my husband's arms that my dear friend was gone. There was chaos swirling around in my head and I had to tell my girls. After that initial shock, I knew what they would be thinking. Oh my gosh, we're stuck with mom? Allie was barely talking to me at this time. John was her big protector. Vicky, he was her best buddy and they bonded over inappropriate TV shows and music that I would never listen to. Steffi, well, she was his little buddy and his princess. With that significant loss, I knew that my daughters were now at risk for so many factors associated with losing a father at such a young age. They would have feelings of abandonment, issues and feelings of loneliness, depression, substance abuse. I am so grateful now more than ever that they hadn't grown up also with conflict between John and I. When children of divorce grow up with parental conflict, they cannot depend on mom and dad for peace and stability. And so they lean on other things and they go down destructive paths. They are more likely to turn to drugs and alcohol. They disengage and become withdrawn. These kids have lower levels of self-esteem and higher rates of anxiety and depression. They feel like the family unit is gone. What can counterbalance this? Peace. Peace is the antidote to the adverse impact of divorce as it provides stability and security to children. Peace is the one variable that can help kids survive the turbulence of divorce. Our three daughters can rest on the peace that John and I put around them. They see me keeping John's memory alive now. It, in fact, it is a great honor for me. 
For instance, there are the squares. John had a love and quite a collection of Hawaiian shirts. As he was passing, I realized that they could be helpful in keeping his memory alive for our children. Plus, I was fairly certain that the fashion industry would not want them back. As his casket was closed, I had the girls each place a square of one of those shirts with him. And now, each time there is a day when he would have a big parenting presence, I put a square for them on their pillow and write simple words on the fabric, like driver's permit, move into college, first swim meet senior year. Recently, we had to walk Vicky for her senior night swim meet, and she had a square of one of those shirts in her hand. He was there with us. And when it comes to raising the girls, it is now my awesome responsibility to represent both John and I. It isn't just my way because he is gone. I make a point to summon his gentle spirit, like when I know she wants to take a 12-hour car ride to see a college again because she can't make up her mind. I do those things because I know he would. I'm still respecting our peace. Now, why did I choose that piece? Well, as we divorced, I thought back to the days when each of my daughters was born, when I held them as newborns in my arms. Gosh, all I wanted for my children was peace and happiness, and I wasn't about to let that get lost just because of our divorce. You know, we knew that the girls needed peace from us in their childhoods, but also our friendship into their adult lives. As we moved forward and launched our daughters, we would be the ones to be parents of the bride at a wedding someday. We would become grandparents together. And rather than make those moments miserable and awkward, we wanted to make them moments of peace. And the great news is that all divorced parents can start to have peace right now. Just starting down a path for peace can transform your life, even if you are on that path alone. First, you have to put down that sword. You may need to be the first one to say, I'm sorry, and that might start only as a tiny little whisper in your heart. Conversely, in your heart, you might have to whisper, I forgive you, to the apology you never received, but feel you so deserve. Next, you have to completely detach emotionally from any outcome. Do not expect anything from the other parent. After all, they may not be ready, and that's okay. You might want to send a picture of your child from a sporting event or activity the other parent cannot attend. Let your ex take the kids on your weekend to her family reunion. If you are ready to take a big step, ask them to sit down for coffee just to talk. Be the agent of change and live without regret. So what's the lesson in all this? Well, first, if you are going to die and your ex-husband or ex-wife is going to get left holding your bag of memories, Make sure it isn't too big of a burden for them to bear. Make sure they can carry your spirit through for you, and it is a great honor for them like it is for me. Your children will need it. But parents should not commit to peace just in case they die. Create peace now to show your children that their family is still a family. It doesn't have to end simply because of the divorce. So finally, my gift to you today is this. I give you permission to lay down that sword that you have been fighting with. I give you permission to start to be peaceful. Don't wait one more day. After all, you have nothing to lose and you and your children have everything to gain.